Hi there, you found us here. It's story time with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever wish you could eat sweet treats all the time? Yes, some say they'd like to eat cookies and ice cream all day and night, Bear. Well, Cammy Kangaroo loves sweets too. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what will happen if Cammy decides to eat all the yummy cookies in her house when no one's looking. Cammy Kangaroo has too many sweets by Stacy Bauer. All was calm in the kangaroo house. Mommy was putting baby Wyatt down for a nap while Cammy Kangaroo was having quiet time in her room. At least she was supposed to be having quiet time. Instead, Cammy's brain was buzzing. She could not stop thinking about treats. Candy, cake, Cookies, ice cream. Cammy loved them all. She knew a great place to find treats at her house. The freezer drawer. Cammy hopped down the stairs and over to the freezer, grabbed the handle and pulled it open. After placing the ice cream into her pouch, Cammy Kangaroo hopped quickly to the playroom and locked the door behind her. Cammy Kangaroo scooped out a little of the ice cream and stuck her paws into her mouth. It was the best ice cream she had ever tasted. She lost track of time as she tried more and more of that delicious ice cream. Cammy, her mommy called. Cammy froze. The playroom door rattled and slowly opened. Mommy sighed and said, come here, Cammy. We need to have a little talk. Cammy, it's not okay to sneak treats, Mommy Kangaroo said. Treats have sugar and can cause cavities. You have a dentist appointment coming up. Next time you want a treat, you need to ask Mommy or Daddy first. Do you understand? Cammy nodded. But the very next day when Mommy took Wyatt upstairs for a nap, Cammy started thinking about treats again. She quietly made her way back to the freezer drawer. But this time it wouldn't open no matter how hard she pulled. She hopped into the pantry searching for more goodies. The top shelf, that's where more treats were hidden. After mommy caught Cammy eating sprinkles in the playroom, she removed the lock from the playroom door and put it on the pantry door. Cammy still didn't give up. She found the cupcakes that were hidden on top of the refrigerator and licked off the frosting. Then she ate Daddy's secret stash of chocolate bars that were in the drawer next to his bed and hid the wrappers behind her dresser. She even found the pan of brownies Mommy hid in the microwave. Every day, Cammy found some way to sneak a treat. 
soon after, it was time for her dentist appointment. Cammie sat in the big dentist chair. After the hygienist cleaned and flossed her teeth, the dentist came in to take a look. The dentist said to Mommy, Well, I'm afraid she has four cavities. Cammy, do you brush and floss your teeth every day? Cammy nodded. Have you been sneaking treats again? Mommy asked. Cammy didn't say anything. Cammy, it's very important that you listen to your parents about treats so you don't get any more cavities, said the dentist. I'm going to let you choose a new toothbrush and some floss. Do you think you can stop sneaking treats? Cammy nodded and said, I'm sorry, Mommy. Mommy gave her a hug. The dentist let her pick out a new toothbrush and some floss. Then Cammie and Mommy Kangaroo headed home. When they got home, Cammie bounded quickly into the house to tell Daddy about the dentist. She caught him and Wyatt sitting on the couch with a big bowl of ice cream. Mommy laughed. <laughs> I think it's safe to say this whole family has had too many sweets. It's time to change our habits. Let's start with a healthy dinner. Fear's wondering, do you think Cammie wants to stop sneaking sweets? <laughs> many say yes. She said she was sorry, Bear. Well. Bear is also asking, who else needs to eat less sugar? Bear thinks her dad does, too. Hmm, who will Cammie need to help her keep eating healthier food? If you said her dad and mom, Bear agrees with you. <laughs> Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in families who make good choices together. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever see a puppy who needs to be adopted or a homeless dog? Yes, sometimes you do. Well, Arfie is homeless, so he's decided to write letters to people asking if he can be their dog. He's hoping to talk someone into wanting him. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Arfi can get anyone to say yes. Can I Be Your Dog? by Troy Cummings. Dear people at Yellow House, woof! Can I be your dog? I am potty trained and I have my own squeaky bone. Also, I love to play. I see you have a cat, but I'm willing to work with you. Who's a good dog? I am. Sincerely, Arfi. P.S. I know every house on Butternut Street. But I asked you first. Dear Arfie, 
We're so sorry, but you cannot be our dog. Our cat is um, allergic to dogs. Good luck in your search. The Honeywells. Dear Butcher Lady, can I be your dog? I think your butcher shop would be a great place for a puppy like me. I could keep the floor nice and clean. Garfy. Look, pal, I've got a bone to pick with you. Last time I let a dog into my shop, a dozen meatballs went missing. Sorry, but there's no way I'm taking in a pooch. Veronica Shank, Butcher. P.S. No hard feelings. Enjoy these dried giblets and good luck finding a home. Nom, nom, nom. Dear Fire Station number five, can I be your dog? I can fetch your boots. Plus, let's just say I know my way around a fire hydrant. I've sniffed out every single one on Butternut Street. And yours is the shiniest. Arfi. Dear applicant, thank you for your interest in working with the Butternut Street Fire Station. Unfortunately, the position of fire dog has already been filled. We will keep your letter on file. Best wishes in your search. Station number five. Dear junkyard guy, I'm not gonna lie, you're my next to last choice. But these past few days have been rough Rough, rough, rough. So, please, can I be your dog? I don't eat much, and I can bark if people try to steal your junk and stuff. Hopefully yours, Arfie. Dear Mutt, get lost. Dear last house on Butternut Street, can I be your dog? I see that your yard is full of weeds and your windows are broken and there's a funny smell. But I'm not picky, just lonely. Arfie. Return to sender. Nobody at this address. Dear Arfi, can I be your person? I need a friend who will be with me no matter what. Snow, rain, heat, or gloom of night. And I see that you already know everyone on Butternut Street. I know you'll make a first-class partner. With hugs and head scratches. Mitzi Whipple, Letter Carrier. P.S. If you agree, 
meet me at the big blue mailbox. Hmm. Dear Mitzi, you know what? My tail has been wagging ever since I got your note. My answer is yes! Truly yours, Arfi. P.S. Woof! Scritch, scratch. Bear's wondering. Do you think Arfi is the right dog for a letter carrier? Some are saying yes. Arfi can even read the envelopes, Bear. Well, do you think Arfi will get enough walks? Many yeses. Bear is asking, someday would you maybe adopt a homeless animal? Hmm. Bear is also hoping you come back soon for more adventures with our animal friends. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Can you imagine forgetting about Christmas? Many say no, Bear. Well, if no one remembered Christmas anymore, would you try to bring Christmas back? Yes, you'd try. Well, these three best friends want to figure out who or what made Christmas stop. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if they can bring Christmas back. Forgotten Christmas by Ash Gilpin. Imagine for a moment a time with out holiday cheer. No carolers or gifts to ring in the new year. A time to be with kith and kin, forgotten those days of kindred celebration. It wasn't until a cold December day when three best of friends got together to play. They happened upon an old broken down shack Remains of a secret still kept intact. It was as if they had walked into another time, back when carolers sang and jingle bells chimed. A spectacle of lights and decorations filled the room. Eggnog and candy canes left out to consume. Earmuff to earmuff, they stood wide in wonder, frozen in speech from the spell they were under. It was there they decided to make a pact, to do whatever they could to bring this holiday back. But before they could set out on such an endeavor, they had to know whoever, whatever, ended this holiday forever. And who better to ask than old Mrs. Marley? She was, after all, the wisest by and largely. Together they rode to her house on the shore. They walked up her front steps and knocked on the door. What do you want? A raspy voice came roaring. We need to know about Christmas, they replied. Hearts all imploring. Without further ado, the door promptly came open. 
Hurry, come inside. It's freezing. You must be frozen. Now, how did you hear of this holiday name? It was Timmy. He did it. He's the one to blame. Now gather round, come closer. I have for you a story about a little boy named Willie and his unwavering desire for glory. Christmas was indeed Willie's favorite time of year. He'd set out milk and cookies and wait for the sound of eight tiny reindeer. He wanted nothing more than to be an elf in Santa's shop, to laugh and dance and make toys all day while drinking Santa's pop. Each year he'd write a letter to Big Red himself about the ideas he had for Christmas and why he should be an elf. But each year the response came back the same. We thank you for your interest. Please try back again. As you can imagine, this rocked Willie to his core. Willie threw away the letters. He wanted so much more. I'll go up to the North Pole and take one of Santa's trees. He'll never know it's missing. I'll return it before he leaves. I'll use its magical powers to make gifts for girls and boys. I'll prove myself to Santa with my inventions of mechanized toys. But Willie's plan had a folly for which he was soon to become aware. Taking that tree from Santa Claus had repercussions he couldn't bear. For little did he know he broke the source of all its power. The absence of its siblings left it wilted like a flower. But this was just the start of an event like no other. The other trees in Christmas land began to wilt like one another. Without the magic of the trees to give power to Santa's shop, Christmas as we knew it came halting to a stop. What have I done, Willie thought to himself. I've ruined Christmas for everyone. I'm not worthy to be an elf. And so Willie, in all his disgrace and shame, ran away forever until time forgot his name. Winters came and went and Christmas soon was lost. The fleeting memories of joyous times melted away like winter's frost. Now it's been said that the return of the tree would undo what's been done. But until that day reveals itself, there'll be no Christmas for you, for me, for anyone. So where do we go? What do we do? How do we make this oppression end? Search your feelings, you know the answer. Just look to your friend. She's right, you know. Yes, of course. The answer is right in front of us. We'll find the tree that Willie took and return it to St. Nicholas. So they set off on a mission to find Santa's missing tree. Days and weeks and months went by before they stumbled upon what just might be a letter, a clue from Willie addressed to Santa Claus himself. I'm sorry I stole your Christmas tree. I'll never be able to forgive myself. But this letter postmarked to Santa was stamped, Return to Sender. If only Santa had received this note, imagine all that he could render. The return address on the envelope gave the boys much needed direction. It led them back to the shack where they first found purpose and introspection. Returning to the shack, you see, had resulted in more than they had expected 
For what at first had gone undetected, the moonlight's glow now projected. Could it be? I think it could. The man who ended Christmas. Yes, of course, I'm sure it is. That's Willie there in the distance. The boys confronted Willie and explained their very plight about the tree he took from Santa, leaving Christmas without light. Yes, I know I've let you down. I've brought such joyous things to end. One could tell right away what Willie needed was a friend. But Willie, what you don't know about that letter you sent up north, it got marked return to sender and got lost in the back and forth. You mean Santa never read my letter? He never knew of my regret? That's exactly what we're saying and why it's so important we correct. Come with me, my new friends, and I will take you to the tree, the one I took all those years ago when I was so young and naive. And so they followed Willie down a dark and winding trail until they came upon a sight of sights they had finally reached their grail. It was just as Mrs. Marley described it, a tree so frail and weak. Perhaps if we just put it in water, Timmy murmured, tongue in cheek. But this was not a time for joking. Time was of the essence. Let's get this tree back to Santa so he can return to making presents. And so they traveled for many a day back to where it had all started, back to Santa's shop in Christmas land, its location left uncharted. But what they had returned to with their mission so absolute was a land time had forgotten, one oh so cold and destitute. Willie's eyes began to water, seeing all that he had caused. Hang in there, buddy. We're almost there, Timmy shouted as Willie paused. Coming in hot, their sleigh malfunctioned, and into Santa's shop it struck. There he is. I see him. Here I go now. Wish me luck. Hello, Santa. Willie here. I'm the one who took your tree. All those many years ago when I was foolish and naive. Willie, my boy, ho, oh, ho, I know you've harbored such regret. Christmas is a time for peace on earth, goodwill toward men, a time to forgive and forget. So all those years of Willie's fear of how Santa would react, the true meaning of Christmas no one could detract. Together they planted that faded tree, restoring magic, power, and light. And to all the children of the world, Merry Christmas and good night. Bears wondering, do you think Willie is on Santa's naughty list? Most say no, Bear. <laughs> well, Bear's asking, why do you think Willie's on Santa's nice list? Hmm, if you were Santa, would you forgive Willie? Well, Bear hopes that he will stay on Santa's nice list when he is truly sorry. Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in being extra kind to others for Christmas. Bye for now. Please subscribe.
Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever hear parents or teachers say, use your words? Sometimes? Well, Frederick the Mouse likes to use his words, especially when things get hard, sometimes, or boring. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Frederick can use his words to help the other mice. Frederick by Leo Leone. All along the meadow where the cows grazed and the horses ran, there was an old stone wall. In that wall, not far from the barn and the granary, a chatty family of field mice had their home. But the farmers had moved away. The barn was abandoned, and the granary stood empty. And since winter was not far off, the little mice began to gather corn and nuts and wheat and straw. They all worked day and night. All except Frederick. Frederick, why don't you work? They asked. I do work, said Frederick. I gather sun rays for the cold, dark winter days. And when they saw Frederick sitting there, staring at the meadow, they said, And now, Frederick? I gather colors, answered Frederick simply, for winter is gray. And once Frederick seemed half asleep. Are you dreaming, Frederick? They asked reproachfully. Frederick said, Oh no, I am gathering words. For the winter days are long and many, and we'll run out of things to say. The winter days came, and when the first snow fell, the five little field mice took to their hideout in the stones. In the beginning, there was lots to eat, and the mice told stories of foolish foxes and silly cats. They were a happy family. But little by little, they had nibbled up most of the nuts and berries. The straw was gone, and the corn was only a memory. It was cold in the wall and no one felt like chatting. Then they remembered what Frederick had said about sun rays and colors and words. What about your supplies, Frederick? They asked. Close your eyes, said Frederick as he climbed on a big stone. Now I send you the rays of the sun. Do you feel how their golden glow? And as Frederick spoke of the sun, the four little mice began to feel warmer. Was it Frederick's voice? Was it magic? the colors, Frederick? They asked anxiously. Close your eyes again, Frederick said. And when he told them of the blue periwinkles, the red poppies in the yellow wheat, and the green leaves of the berry bush, they saw the colors as clearly as if they had been painted in their minds. And the words, Frederick? 
Frederick cleared his throat, <clears throat> waited a moment, and then said, as if from a stage, he said, Who scatters snowflakes? Who melts the ice? Who spoils the weather? Who makes it nice? Who grows the four-leaf clovers in June? Who dims the daylight? Who lights the moon? Four little field mice who live in the sky. Four little field mice like you and I. One is the spring mouse who turns on the showers. Then comes the summer who paints in the flowers. The fall mouse is next with walnuts and wheat. And winter is last with little cold feet. Aren't we lucky the seasons are four? Think of a year with one less or one more. When Frederick had finished, they all applauded. But Frederick, they said, you are a poet. Frederick blushed, took a bow, and said shyly, I know it. Bears wondering. Do you think Frederick's words helped the other mice? Yes? Well, Bear's also asking, do you really think Frederick's words help them feel warm, think about happy colors, and maybe even talk about the ideas in his poem? Many do, Bear. Hmm. Do you think you can collect words that could help others feel better? Well, Bear hopes you will and that you come back soon for more adventures in using your words to help others. Bye for now. Please subscribe. time with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you need music as much as you need food? Most say no Bear. They need food more than music. Well, Geraldine the mouse is happy because she just found an enormous piece of food. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what will happen when Geraldine starts hearing music coming from the food. Geraldine, the Music Mouse by Leo Leone. Geraldine had never heard music before. Noises, yes, many noises the voices of people, the slamming of doors, the barking of dogs, the rushing of water, the meows of cats in the courtyard, and of course, the soft peeping of mice. But music, never. Then, one morning, in the pantry of the empty house where Geraldine lived, she discovered an enormous piece of Parmesan cheese, the largest she had ever seen. Eagerly, she took a little bite from it. It was delicious. But how would she be able to take it to her secret hideout in the barn? She ran to her friends who lived next door and told them about her discovery. If you help me carry it to my hideout, she said, I'll give each of you a big piece. Her friends who loved cheese happily agreed. Let's go, they said, and off they went. It's enormous, it's gigantic. 
It's immense. It's fantastic, they shouted with joy when they saw the piece of cheese. They pushed and pulled and tugged, and finally they managed to carry it to Geraldine's hideout. There, Geraldine climbed to the very top of the cheese. She dug her little teeth into it and pulled away crumb after crumb chunk after chunk. As her friends carried away their cheese tidbits, Geraldine peered in amazement at the hole she had gnawed. There she saw the shapes of two enormous ears, cheese ears. As soon as her friends were gone, she went back to work again, nibbling away at the cheese as fast as she could. When she was halfway through, Geraldine climbed down to have a look at the forms she had freed. She could hardly believe what she saw. The ears were those of a giant mouse, still partly hidden, of solid cheese. To its puckered lips, it held a flute. Geraldine gnawed and gnawed until she had finally uncovered the entire mouse. Then she realized that the flute was really the tip of the mouse's tail. Astonished, exhausted, and a little frightened, Geraldine stared at the cheese statue. With the dimming of the last daylight, she fell asleep. Suddenly, she was awakened by some strange sounds. They seemed to come from the direction of the mouse's flute. She jumped to her feet. As it grew darker, the sounds became clearer and more melodious until they seemed to move lightly through the air like invisible strings of silver and gold. Never had Geraldine heard anything so beautiful. Music, she thought. This must be music. She listened all through the night until the first glow of dawn filtered through the dusty window panes. But as the cheese mouse was slowly bathed in light, the music became softer until it stopped altogether. Play, play, Geraldine begged. Play some more. But not a sound came from the flute. Will it ever play again? Geraldine thought as she gobbled up some of the crumbs that lay around. When the next evening approached, it brought the answer to her question. The music began faintly at dusk and lasted until the break of day. And so, night after night, the cheese flutist played for Geraldine. She learned to recognize the melodies, and even in daylight, they lingered in her ears. Then one day, she met her friends on the street. They were desperate. Geraldine, they said, we have no more food and there is none to be found anywhere. You must share your cheese with us. But that is not possible, Geraldine shouted. Why? asked the others angrily. Because, because, because it is music. Her friends looked at Geraldine surprised. What is music? They asked all together. For a moment, Geraldine stood deep in thought. Then she took a step backward, solemnly lifted the tip of her tail to her puckered lips, took a deep breath and blew. She blew hard. She puffed. She peeped. She tweeted, 
She screeched. Her friends laughed until their hungry little tummies hurt. Then a long, soft, beautiful whistle came from Geraldine's lips. One of the melodies of the cheese flute echoed in the air. The little mice held their breath in amazement. Other mice came to hear the miracle. When the tune came to an end, Gregory, the oldest of the group, whispered, If this is music, Geraldine, you are right. We cannot eat that cheese. No, said Geraldine joyfully. Now we can eat the cheese because now the music is in me. With that, they all followed Geraldine to the barn. And while Geraldine whistled the gayest of tunes, they ate cheese to their tummies content. Mira's wondering, do you think Geraldine was surprised to find out that she had beautiful music inside her? Yes? Well, how did she get her music? Hmm. Mira wonders if it came to her because she really listened and loved it so much. Maybe so, Bear. Well, Bear is also asking if you think her friends found out that they need music as well as food. Hmm. Bear is also hoping you come back soon for more adventures in listening. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you need music as much as you need food? Most say no, Bear. They need food more than music. Well, Geraldine the Mouse is happy because she just found an enormous piece of food. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what will happen when Geraldine starts hearing music coming from the food. Geraldine, the Music Mouse by Leo Leone. Geraldine had never heard music before. Noises, yes, many noises the voices of people, the slamming of doors, the barking of dogs, the rushing of water, the meows of cats in the courtyard, and of course, the soft peeping of mice. But music, never. Then, one morning, in the pantry of the empty house where Geraldine lived, she discovered an enormous piece of Parmesan cheese, the largest she had ever seen. Eagerly, she took a little bite from it. It was delicious. But how would she be able to take it to her secret hideout in the barn? She ran to her friends who lived next door and told them about her discovery. If you help me carry it to my hideout, she said, I'll give each of you a big piece. Her friends who loved cheese happily agreed. Let's go, they said, and off they went. It's enormous, it's gigantic, it's immense, it's fantastic. They shouted with joy when they saw the piece of cheese. They pushed and pulled and tugged. And finally, they managed to carry it to Geraldine's hideout. 
there, Geraldine climbed to the very top of the cheese. She dug her little teeth into it and pulled away crumb after crumb, chunk after chunk. As her friends carried away their cheese tidbits, Geraldine peered in amazement at the hole she had gnawed. There she saw the shapes of two enormous ears, cheese ears. As soon as her friends were gone, she went back to work again, nibbling away at the cheese as fast as she could. When she was halfway through, Geraldine climbed down to have a look at the forms she had freed. She could hardly believe what she saw. The ears were those of a giant mouse, still partly hidden, of solid cheese. To its puckered lips, it held a flute. Geraldine gnawed and gnawed until she had finally uncovered the entire mouse. Then she realized that the flute was really the tip of the mouse's tail. Astonished, exhausted, and a little frightened, Geraldine stared at the cheese statue. With the dimming of the last daylight, she fell asleep. Suddenly, she was awakened by some strange sounds. They seemed to come from the direction of the mouse's flute. She jumped to her feet. As it grew darker, the sounds became clearer and more melodious until they seemed to move lightly through the air like invisible strings of silver and gold. Never had Geraldine heard anything so beautiful. Music, she thought. This must be music. She listened all through the night until the first glow of dawn filtered through the dusty window panes. But as the cheese mouse was slowly bathed in light, the music became softer until it stopped altogether. Play, play, Geraldine begged. Play some more. But not a sound came from the flute. Will it ever play again? Geraldine thought as she gobbled up some of the crumbs that lay around. When the next evening approached, it brought the answer to her question. The music began faintly at dusk and lasted until the break of day. And so, night after night, the cheese flutist played for Geraldine. She learned to recognize the melodies and even in daylight, they lingered in her ears. Then one day, she met her friends on the street. They were desperate. Geraldine, they said, we have no more food and there is none to be found anywhere. You must share your cheese with us. But that is not possible. Geraldine shouted. Why? asked the others angrily. Because, because, because it is music. Her friends looked at Geraldine surprised. What is music? they asked all together. For a moment, Geraldine stood deep in thought. Then she took a step backward solemnly lifted the tip of her tail to her puckered lips, took a deep breath and blew. She blew hard, she puffed, she peeped, she tweeted, she screeched. Her friends laughed until their hungry little tummies hurt. Then a long, soft, beautiful whistle came from Geraldine's lips. One of the melodies of the cheese flute echoed in the air. 
the little mice held their breath in amazement. Other mice came to hear the miracle. When the tune came to an end, Gregory, the oldest of the group, whispered, If this is music, Geraldine, you are right. We cannot eat that cheese. No, said Geraldine joyfully. Now we can eat the cheese because now the music is in me. With that, they all followed Geraldine to the barn. And while Geraldine whistled the gayest of tunes, they ate cheese to their tummies content. Mira's wondering, do you think Geraldine was surprised to find out that she had beautiful music inside her? Yes? Well, how did she get her music? Hmm. Mira wonders if it came to her because she really listened and loved it so much. Maybe so, Bear. Well, Bear's also asking if you think her friends found out that they need music as well as food. Hmm. Bear's also hoping you come back soon for more adventures in listening. Bye for now. Please subscribe. there you found us here at story time with miss becky i'm miss becky and this is our friend bear who loves to read along with you bear has a question for you what kind of valentine would you give to your cat or dog or to your family or even to your teddy bear hmm bear needs some ideas well, this boy is coming up with all sorts of new ideas for Valentine's, and they're not always a card. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what Valentine's he's going to give. If You'll Be My Valentine by Cynthia Ryland. If you'll be my Valentine, I'll kiss you on the nose. I'll scratch your ears and rub your head and pet your little toes. If you'll be my Valentine, I'll give you extra treaties. I'll give you two and maybe three and let you lick my feeties. If you'll be my valentine, I'll take you on a walk. I'll pull the wagon just for you, and we can sing and talk. If you'll be my valentine, I'll write a special letter. I'll add some hugs and kisses too, to make it even better. If you'll be my valentine, I'll sit with you today. We'll read a book about some frogs, if you don't want to play. If you'll be my valentine, I'll take you in my car. You'll sit up front so you can look, but we won't go too far. If you'll be my valentine, I'll sing a song for you. And when you fly up in the sky, then you can sing one too. If you'll be my valentine, I'll pour our tea at three. Spicy cookies and an orange just for you and me.
If you'll be my Valentine, I'll make you funny faces. You can make them back at me when we go different places. If you'll be my Valentine, then I'll be one for you. We'll love the trees and all the world. We'll love each other too. Happy Valentine's Day! Bear's wondering, did you get some ideas for your Valentines? A lot of yeses, Bear. Well, Bear liked the way the boy took his teddy bear for a ride. <laughs> Do you think a Valentine always has to be a card? Lots of nos. Now Bear's asking, can a Valentine just be your own way of showing love? Hmm. Bear also hopes you come back soon for more Valentine adventures. Bye for now. Please subscribe. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever thought the first day of school might not be very fun, and then gotten a big surprise? Hmm, a few yeses, Bear. Well, Zach is thinking that this year will probably be like other years. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what happens when Zach's new teacher, Miss Smith, walks in. Miss Smith's Incredible Storybook by Michael Garland. It was the first day of school. Zach was waiting for his teacher to arrive. Boring, boring, he thought. Why would this year be any different from the last one? Then, the door swung open. Good morning, class. My name is Miss Smith, and I am your new teacher. Miss Smith seemed very different from Zach's other teachers. But the day went along like every school day Zach could remember until Miss Smith said, it's story time. When she sat at her desk and started to read from the book she had brought with her, Zach couldn't believe his eyes. The storybook characters came to life and the classroom was swept up in a swashbuckling pirate tale. Zack and the rest of his class were right in the middle of the story. He could feel the breeze in his hair and hear the waves pounding on the side of the ship. From then on, Zack couldn't wait to go to school. Every day there was a new story to look forward to. When Miss Smith finished reading, all the characters and adventure whooshed back into her book. On Friday, Principal Written Rotten stood in front of the class instead of Miss Smith. Miss Smith is stuck in traffic, so she has asked me to read to you until she arrives, he announced. Zack wondered what would happen next. Principal Written Rotten started to read. Zack grinned when a princess leaped out of the book, 
followed closely by a fire-breathing dragon and a brave knight on his horse. Principal Written Rotten was so surprised that all he could do was scream and throw the book up in fright. I'm going for help, he called over his shoulder as he ran out the door. Before Zack could think of anything to do, Sue Ann pounced on the storybook, but she didn't finish the dragon story. She started reading another one instead. The princess, the dragon, and the knight did not return to the book, but the three bears and Goldilocks climbed out. Freddy, the class clown, jumped out of his seat and tried to yank the book away. When Sue Ann let go, he tumbled backward and the book flew across the room. The whole class laughed. Billy caught the book and started reading from a new story. Zack shook his head in amazement when the Mad Hatter, the Cheshire Cat, and Alice popped out to join the others. As the book passed from kid to kid, one character after another flew out of the pages. The classroom was getting very crowded. This is trouble, Zack said to himself. The chaos was beginning to spill out into the halls. Why don't you finish the stories, Zack pleaded, but no one was listening. Miss Smith brought her car to a screeching stop in front of the school. Uh-oh, there seems to be a little problem, she said to herself as she raced inside. Meanwhile, Zack was shouting, We have to finish the story so the characters will go back into the book. But the storybook characters didn't want to go back. A tug of war began. Miss Smith appeared in the doorway. With one look, she let everyone know she meant business. Even the dragon was suddenly silent. Zack handed the book back to Miss Smith. She ruffled through the pages, adjusted her glasses, and started to read. The class sat spellbound as she finished each story in turn. With a swirl and a whoosh, one character after another disappeared into the book until the classroom was quiet and tidy again. Principal Written Rotten and a team of firefighters skidded to a halt at the door just as Miss Smith closed her book. May I help you, Principal Written Rotten? asked Miss Smith. But the principal couldn't seem to answer. He just stared at the quiet class with his mouth wide open. Miss Smith flashed a secret smile at her class. Zack smiled right back. Who would ever have guessed that reading could be so much fun? Here's wondering, do you think all the kids in Zach's class wanted a turn at getting storybook characters to come alive? Yes. <laughs> hmm. Would you want to turn to read in Zach's class too? Yes, is Bear. Well, Bear's also asking, do you think Principal Written Rotten will ever figure out what's going on? Let us know. Bear's hoping you come back soon for more magical reading adventures. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there.
there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you thought about what you would like to be when you're grown up? Hmm. Some are asking, what new kinds of jobs will there be in the future? Well, Louise's amazing job will be to make the clouds rain for the farmers. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if you'd like Louise's job or if there's a new job you might like more. New Jobs Full of Wonder by Al Faso. A weather rainmaker. Like Louise, you could launch amazing micro rockets into the clouds, which cause rain to fall back on the earth. This will make the farmers very happy because rain is needed for the crops to do well so that there can be a large harvest. Would you also want to make it rain? How about a driverless car traffic controller? Elliot can decide where all the cars, taxis, and trucks move to make sure there are no accidents. Do you think it would be cool to control the cars on the roads? Or maybe you could be an urban farmer specialized in aquaponics. Maya and Eden grow fruit and vegetables using large fish tanks. The water has nutrients for the plants and the fish feed on the roots of the plants. Would you enjoy growing plants and raising fish to sell? Why not be a chef cooking insects? Charlotte cooks delicious scorpion burgers. She also prepares tasty cricket soups. Could you imagine even crazier recipes? Or would you rather be a firefighter drone pilot? Ronnie pilots magnificent firefighting drones and saves human and animal lives. And you, would you have the skills to do this job? You are lucky to have so many jobs to choose from. Maybe you should be a deep water data diver. Jack dives into the ocean to repair large boxes filled with information called data. He uses special tools to make sure that people receive internet service at the speed of a rocket. Would you like to have marvelous underwater adventures? Or do you want to be a digital privacy detective? Meta searches and deletes personal information that people don't want to have on the internet. She helps people become invisible on the web. Would you love to protect other people's secrets? Or do you wish to catch bad guys as a cyber cop? Paul fights against the attacks of the pirates on the internet. He protects other people's computers by blocking viruses and stopping scamming attacks. Would you like to protect the internet for everyone on the planet? How about a crowdfunding specialist? Angel helps others to make their dreams come true. He collects money from internet users around the world. This is possible thanks to his creativity and his great communication skills. Would you love to help people to share their great ideas with the rest of the world? If you love drawing and making things, then you could choose to become an upcycling designer. Lola transforms waste materials into new products. As if by magic, 
she changes toothbrushes and other used plastic objects into jewelry. And she turns cardboard boxes into furniture. And you, could you imagine other surprising things? Or you could be a 3D designer. Donna draws and creates awesome objects straight out of her imagination. Thanks to her computer and a fantastic printer, she can produce everything in three dimensions, 3D. This means that she can make toys, vases, shoes, whatever she wants with her incredible printer. Would you like to use your creativity to produce new things? Or maybe a big data scientist. Big data, these are all the numbers, words, photos, and videos called data, which circulate the world. The amount of data on the web is enormous and keeps growing non-stop. Stephen knows how to understand all this data and can solve problems, even before they appear. Abracadabra, he can tell you where to place a wind turbine so it catches the most wind. Would you enjoy giving meaning to data just as Stephen does? You could become a good robotics engineer like Leo. Robots are made to do things that are too boring or too dangerous for humans. Leo, the master of the robots, knows how to write instructions in robot language. In this way, he can tell the robots to efficiently do the work that humans want them to do. Would you enjoy being such a great guide? Or why not become a guardian of space safety? Neil removes the remnants of old rockets and old satellites sent by humans into space. Then he places them in a space dump to avoid any accidents. Do you look forward to making outer space less dangerous? How about a virtual presentation coach? Anna teaches others how to bring out the best of themselves when presenting. She advises them how to smile at the camera and speak clearly. And you, would you like to help others give the best version of themselves? Or do you wish to be a rewilder? Tom is an agricultural scientist who repairs the damage done to Earth by people, factories, and cars. Would you also cherish taking care of the Earth? Or, like Nina, be a nano-scientist. Nina takes tiny pieces of matter, breaks them up, and puts them back together in amazing ways. These smart materials such as super strong and foldable plastics can even be used to make cars. Would you be interested in creating new materials? Or do you wish to be a telesurgeon? Charlie carefully uses an incredible robot scalpel which can be used to operate on human beings or animals from very far away. Would you be happy to offer medical care from the other end of the world? You might be an avatar specialist as James. Avatars are virtual characters which exist only on the internet. James, who is responsible for the avatars, decides on their shape, their actions, and their extraordinary adventures. Does bringing these wonderful characters to life appeal to you? Maybe you should be a researcher in bio-inspiration. Mary makes use of great ideas taken from nature to help her solve problems. For example, she might experiment with snail slime to make a new 
odorless kind of glue. And you, would you have the patience to observe animals and plants? Bear's wondering, have you heard of any of these jobs? Lots of no's, Bear, because most of these jobs won't be possible till they're grown up. Well, Bear says he would like to launch rockets into the clouds to make rain for farmers. But he does not think he'd be very good at cooking cricket soup. <laughs> Bear also hopes you think about all you might do someday and that you come back soon for more adventures in possibilities. Bye for now. Please subscribe.